Okay, so when you do something such as walk, one possibility for how you walk is that you hit your, your foot on the ground and that elicits a reflex that then lifts your foot and that elicits a reflex that extends your leg and that elicits a reflex that uh, flexes your leg. And, and so you go through this chain of reflexes that allows you to, uh, to walk forward. Well, that's not how we do it. We don't do it that way. We use something that, that Charles Sherrington uh, described and uh, as a central pattern generator. And a central pattern generator is, is a conceptual term. There is a physical reality to it, but um, the, the essential uh, uh, concept is that it's a group of neurons that will produce a movement. And it will produce that movement no matter, without any sensory feedback. So no involvement of reflexes. Reflexes is information coming in and, and information going, and then an output that in, is in response to the information coming in. In the, in the situation of a central pattern generation, it's just out, okay? It's the central nervous system is going to produce this movement. No, no sense, sensory involvement. We have central pattern generators that do things such as allow us to walk, allow us to stand. We'll talk more about posture and postural sway and the central pattern generator for that in the next uh, series of videos. But right now we're gonna concentrate on walking. There are other central pattern generators for chewing, and there are central pattern generators for, for less rhythmic movements, things such as vomiting, swallowing, um, sneezing, coughing, all of these things, all of these uh, innate behaviors, behaviors that occur in everybody, have a, a, a group of neurons, sucking is another one, which enable the individual to, um, to produce this baseline movement. Now, while I said, while I've emphasized that a central pattern generator just pr puts out the movement, no holds barred, nothing, nothing changing it, uh, nothing is necessary to change it, it is just an output. In point of fact, in healthy individuals, the feedback from the outside, from the environment and from your own uh, body is necessary to make that movement smooth. So for example, if I was walking across an even surface, I could get away to a certain extent with minimal sensory feedback. Um, I can't even, I, that, that's actually not possible to do, uh, and I'll tell you how I know that, but uh, it takes less sensory feedback to walk across a, a, an even surface, but we're never walking across this even surface. We're in, in, through evolutionary time, and, and in fact, even in modern times, we walk across a field, and, and we're not walking without loads. So you're carrying an, a backpack, which is throwing off your, your center of mass, you're, you're holding a child, you're uh, carrying groceries, whatever you're doing, it, or, or you're going upstairs. All of these things are gonna change the required movement that you put out. So the central pattern generator, while it doesn't require sensory feedback, is fine-tuned by sensory feedback. Okay, so how do I know that you can't use a central pattern generator without, um, without sensory feedback? Let's remember Ian Waterman. Ian Waterman um, it, uh, was, uh, is a man who at 19 lost all the touch and proprioception from his neck down. And he, when he first, uh, when he first recovered from, from the acute illness, he, he couldn't move. He could not move. Um, but he taught himself essentially to engage his central pattern generators. And he could cognitively drive himself to, uh, the first thing he did was to, to learn how to sit up. He, he thought about sitting up. He did it, and as long as he could see, oh, okay, that's what I have to think in order to get me to sit up. And then he could do the same thing. 
okay, that's what I have to think. That's what the output I need to get through my central pattern generators in order to put my foot forward. Um, and he could slowly do that because he, he remembered it from when he was healthy. Um, uh, now, he was still getting sensory feedback, but his sensory feedback was not the sensory feedback that you and I get. He wasn't getting some sensory feedback. He was getting visual feedback. And so he used visual feedback to guide his engagement of central pattern generator uh, movements. Um, without vision, as I, as I said before, uh, he couldn't move. Okay, so what is the central pattern generator? So, so we're going to look at the walking central pattern generator because that's really an important one. And it's one that is um, that has a lot of safety factors to it. So both the standing and walking central pattern generators, standing and walking have a lot of safety factor. And that, what does that mean? That means that if somebody falls and there's not a good reason why they fall, that fall should be interrogated. Certainly if somebody falls repeatedly, that's not, uh, that's not a, you know, that's something you need to understand why that happened and need to, and, and need to fix it. Okay. So what's the central pattern generator? This shows you a small child and they're doing some elements of the, of the uh, central pattern generator, which is there is a gait cycle for each leg and that gait cycle is in, 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 revert, in opposite phase. And so when one uh, leg is back, the other leg is forward and vice versa, there's a short period, about 10% of the walking cycle that is double support where both of the feet are in contact with the, uh, with the ground. <clears throat> Now, one of the really cool things about a central pattern generator is that you can use this same central pattern generator. You can reconfigure it to do very similar movements. So you could reconfigure this same CPG to give you running. Instead of walking, you could give running. And what's the difference with running? Well, the support, the time in double support is, is uh, shortened and the, the propulsion is, is increased. Um, you could alter this to get the, the, uh, the kick in the crawl, uh, in the crawl uh, swim stroke. So you can get multiple outputs from one group of neurons. They just reconfigure. You could get skipping or hopping uh, from the same thing that gives you walking or running. All right. Another um, feature of this is that in humans, it's a little different from, say, uh, the cat and other quadrupeds. So in humans, there's a central pattern generator in the spinal cord that does the gait, that does one leg's gait and the other leg's gait, and that is true in the cat as well, or other quadrupeds. Um, uh, but there's also a part, a, a, an area in the midbrain which coordinates that. And that's actually true in the cat as well. Um, but what's different is that the, the uh, central pattern generator in the spinal cord is not as competent as it is in quadrupeds in humans. Humans do not have uh, the ability to walk if supported using just their spinal cord. So if you had a cat and they, were, they, they had a spinal cord lesion, and you supported their weight, so you're just you're simply supporting their their um, their balance essentially. They will move their legs, and they will change their the movement of their legs in uh, time with a with a uh, treadmill. That's not true for humans, and so the reality of spinal cord injury is that um, the ability to walk. Uh, in the way that one walked before is very unlikely. If, if after a week, a week after a spinal cord injury, if a person can't walk um, without uh, extreme interventions, that's going to be true 20 years later as well. In the final um, video, we're going to look at two reflexes that modulate the um, 
the, the walking cycle. And we're also gonna look at the walking cycle across the life cycle.